Hey folks, it's that time. It is that time again. It is time for another session of Getting to Know Dynatrace. So this week uh, for Getting to Know Dynatrace, we have Jason Bordelotti, who uh, I work with all the time. Hey Jason, how you doing? How's it going? Happy to be here. Hey Jonesy, hey everybody. All right. So folks, um, we're going to get into uh, Jason doing a demonstration in a few moments. I'm going to start things off by getting our presentation going here so let's get into this now um for those folks who have attended the getting to know dynatrace session in the past you know what makes these sessions are your questions and if you dynatrace if you've never seen one of these sessions before please feel free to ask questions. Uh, use whatever whatever channel that you're watching us on, if it's LinkedIn, if it's Facebook, if it's Twitch, if it's uh, you know, Twitter, whatever, whatever that channel is, YouTube, feel free to ask questions inside of the chat window. And then what's going to happen is we're going to take those questions and we're going to bounce them up onto the screen. And uh, we're going to do our best Folks, feel free to ask us whatever questions that you like about Dynatrace. We're more than happy to answer them. If we can't answer them, we'll put a pin into them, and we'll try to get an answer for you at a later date. But with that, getting to know Dynatrace always has a couple of upfront se uh, segments that we like to go through. The first one is what's new. And as always with getting to know Dynatrace, where do you go to find out the latest and greatest information about Dynatrace? you go to the Dynatrace blog. So when you go to the Dynatrace blog, you're going to see all sorts of new articles, new updates. As a matter of fact, let's flip over there right now into the Dynatrace blog, and let's see some of the new things that uh, that you know have been published since the last time that we talked. Uh, there's an interesting article here on uh, understanding what a container as a service is as it compares to, say, PaaS, IaaS, and uh, <laughs> functions as a service. I, I didn't even feel comfortable trying to pronounce that. Um, you know, actually, these acronyms, folks, container as a service, uh, PASS, which is platform as a service, IAS, which is the uh, infrastructure as a service, and FAST, which is essentially the functions as a service. You know, all of these different sort of acronyms are out there, and we're seeing more and more organizations adopting these types of approaches uh, uh, to, um, you know, delivering their apps. So there's a lot of really good information in that article. If you're not familiar with the terminology, uh, feel free, give it a read. But you can see here that we've got a whole bunch of other stuff that uh, we've been uh, promoting over the past couple of weeks. One of them is if you are watching today and if you are thinking about or are a partner of Dynatrace, and that is, uh, you want to know about the uh, Dynatrace Amplify Partner Enablement Power Up Series. So there is a, a partner portal, which is dedicated towards educating our partners, letting them know um, more about Dynatrace, how to do things with Dynatrace. So I invite you to give that article a read as well. And you can see here that there's all sorts, I'm not going to go into every single one of these, um, there's a whole bunch of different articles, which you know are all great. This is great content. It really gives you sort of an idea as to how Dynatrace can be applied to specific things within our industry. For example, this one right here, what is MTTR? You know, I'll give you a sort of the the you know the the little sort of uh, you know hint there. MTTR mean time to resolution. So typically it's a measure of when we discover a problem, how much time is it taking us for us to resolve 
that problem. This article, this blog article is actually really interesting and it goes in depth as to how Dynatrace helps out by helping organizations reduce their overall MTTR. And you can see here that there's all sorts of great stuff. One of the things I mentioned last week, but I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about, and that is the Dynatrace release notes. This is critical. If you're uh, no, new to Dynatrace, one of the things that uh, you should know is that Dynatrace, uh, we provide updates uh, every couple of weeks to the Dynatrace platform. And so twice a month for our SaaS platform, once a month for our on-premise or managed deployment model, uh, we are providing updates. And if you go into these updates, uh, into these release notes, you're going to be able to see all of the different details in terms of things that have changed and have been updated. I'm, I'm using this one as an example because you know, obviously we talked a couple of weeks ago about our exciting new announcement about our Grail storage technology. And we have some upcoming segments um, you know, on getting to know Dynatrace and some additional ask me anything sessions around grail so i invite you to go to that and uh, attend because it's going to provide you even more detail about what's going on with this uh, new grail storage uh, mechanism that we're using so you can see here that this covers everything from you know this grail enabling technology that's now part of the platform it talks about our new dql or the dynatrace query language how our logs and analytics are powered by grail how our business analytics are also powered by Grail. But there's other things that this also covers. Like, for example, uh, this talks about how, you know, we've got new functionality for showing data retention on service analysis charts, uh, how you can go in and there's a new calendar picker, how the uh, new one agent log module for AIX works, uh, how we've changed things up for how we monitor Kubernetes services, our updated metric events, I can just go on. This list is, you know, it's it's pretty extensive. And that's just a sign. It just sort of illustrates exactly why Dynatrace is focused on innovation. We're constantly putting out new capabilities, new features um, to those folks that, you know, are, are, are users of Dynatrace. So that's, uh, you know, that segment, which is the, you know, let's get back to our presentation here, which is, you know, what's new at Dynatrace. Let's go on to the next segment which is, did you know? Now, I always like with the did you know uh, segments of Dynatrace, for those folks that are Dynatrace users coming to the session, trying to find you know, um, uh, you know, know, things that you may not have known about, I, I use this segment uh, to really sort of cover that. And so this week, did you know that the Dynatrace Data Explorer now provides templates? And what do we mean by this? So in the Dynatrace Data Explorer, this is where you would go inside of Dynatrace to create a chart, create a visualization or a query that you want visualized in some fashion. And so now what we've done is we've added templates into this. So these are predefined templates that you simply just have to choose the template and then it's just gonna automatically show you that visualization. Now, I normally don't do this during the uh, Did You Know session, but I wanted to today. I'm just gonna flip into uh, an instance of Dynatrace. So here I'm in Dynatrace now. I'm not going to steal any of Jason's thunder doing a demonstration. I'm strictly just going to go to that data explorer and I want to show you what these templates look like. So here you can see these templates. And the great thing about them is that, you know, with the data explorer, if I wanted to chart something out, typically I have to go in, I have to select my metric. And then I choose, how do I want to split things out by? How do I want to filter things? I might want to add metrics to this. Uh, I can even go into this code level view. And if I wanted to, I could build it out in a more programmatic fashion. But these templates just make it so simple. Like as an example, if I want, I could just select this template now and it's already pre-populated. So basically it's gone in here. It's giving me my server side response time. It's splitting this by service. This was the code that was being generated. So if I wanted to do uh, or get this data programmatically, 
There, it's giving me an idea as to what that's going to look like. And here's that visualization already pre-populated. That's pretty cool. And if you weren't aware of these templates, now you are. So that is a little bit more about, did you know that we have these pre-populated templates? It just makes visualizing things and pinning things to a dashboard uh, that much easier. And so uh, before we wrap up on the, did you know, uh, let's also talk about, did you know that Dynatrace Perform is coming up uh, February 16th, uh, 13th to 16th uh, in Las Vegas. Now, it's going to be held at the uh, Cosmopolitan Hotel, which is a fabulous venue. But the uh, the Dynatrace Perform sessions, one of the you know coolest parts about it are the hands-on training sessions. And so if you've not registered, these sessions are filling up fast. And so my recommendation to you is if you're thinking of attending... Uh, sign up for those hot day sessions as soon as you can, because once they're filled up, we, we can't add more people. These are literally in person, in class, hands on sessions. So we have a set limit of people that can attend these. So um, always, always, always the feedback that I get from people is one of the best things about perform, uh, you know, not obviously just the opportunity to get to see everyone and talk about uh, Dynatrace and what Dynatrace does for their um, organizations, for their careers, but being able to get into these hands-on training sessions, it, it's, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, best things about the uh, perform conference. And then another thing I wanted to sort of draw everyone's attention to, I'd mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again. And that is uh, next week, November 9th, Please join myself, and I think we've got uh, Mike Taylor and Rob John, who um, the three of us, we're going to do an Ask Me Anything session all about Grail, this new storage technology, which is an underlying part of the Dynatrace platform. And we're going to specifically talk about how it can be applied for log uh, logging and business analytics. So you know, feel free to join us November 9th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, to uh, you know, basically find out more about Grail, and with that, that sort of concludes our opening segments. And now it's time for what everyone is really here to see, which is the demo. So I'm going to stop sharing now, and we're going to hand things over to Jason. So Jason, over to you, my friend. Uh, let's let's walk through a demonstration of Dynatrace. And while Jason's getting set up, as I mentioned, folks. What makes this um, these Dynatrace getting to know Dynatrace sessions so useful and so unique are your questions. So please feel free to ask those questions, and we'll do our best to try answering them. With that, Jason, over to you, my friend. Awesome. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that? Looks good. All right, perfect. Um, you know what? One uh, one just quick shout out to uh to perform definitely anybody who is on tuning in right now definitely check out those uh hands-on sessions um and i'm just gonna send out a personal plug to the uh like the advanced uh cloud performance hands-on session so i'm gonna be part of that and uh it's gonna be really interesting if anybody on the call is interested in trying that out um having said that yeah let's let's hop right into this demo so i know jonesy was showing off some of the dashboards and some of those new features regarding things like um, just like those built in uh, dashboards that you can just drag and drop like immediately from the data explorer. So this is what I'm showing you right now, an example of maybe a more executive level dashboard where we're trying to give you a taste of a little bit of everything that Dynatrace has to offer here. So you'll notice uh, on the side here, I got things like my problem feed and it's telling me where they're coming from. So is this an infrastructure problem, like a web services problem, a problem with my databases? You get a bird's eye view of how your applications at large are performing. So things like how do my synthetic monitors look? What's the performance of my front end web apps? Uh, you can see like what are your top web applications, how many transactions are you seeing per minute? Where are people hitting your site from? What's their overall experience look like? Um, there, there's a lot to potentially unpack here. We're just trying to put in on this dashboard, like the the really the most meaningful metrics that you'd want to be aware of when you're just taking that executive level view of what is actually going on in your monitored environment. 
So we're going to do the same thing for the services. You get a breakdown of services by type, overall service health, request count, failure rate, response time. Uh, and then you can, even, you can even play around with things like different percentiles of response time within all those services. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to be doing things for the infrastructure view as well. So now you get a breakdown of those hosts, breakdown hosts by type. So in our demo, we're mostly running Linux and Windows. That's why you see only really these two up here. Um, you're seeing things like your memory, uh, your CPU, your disk, your NIC. You get a breakdown into your database. So again, we're trying just to give you really high level view. There's a lot more that could potentially be on this dashboard. Um, and there's a lot more, there's probably like infinitely more options of more in-depth or more specific dashboards that you could probably get to if that was something you're interested in. So just one thing to keep in mind today during the demo, literally everything I show you, um, these are all metrics as far as Dynatrace is concerned, and they're all chartable in dashboards. Oftentimes, you're going to see an option to just pin directly from any of the pages I'm on. It'll have an option to pin directly to a dashboard where it'll just drop in a tile that shows you all the information you're currently looking at. Alternatively, the Data Explorer allows you to literally leverage everything that we are monitoring in Dynatrace. So that's just something uh, I want everybody to kind of keep in mind here because we could talk about dashboards in and of themselves probably for hours on end. But just to give you all an idea of what you're getting here, we're trying to give you a single pane of glass, glass here where you can just view everything potentially, maybe something really specific. But ultimately, the idea of Dynatrace is we're trying to give you visibility into everything end to end. So an important piece just to keep in mind here as well is we're looking at databases, infrastructure, services, your apps, problems at large, synthetics. This is all being monitored on the same platform. And this becomes really important later on when we're talking about things like problem cards or alert management, because you're feeding all of this context back to the Davis AI. It is going to be crunching all these numbers for you, and it's going to try to spit out problem cards dynamically, and it's going to try to do it with as much context um, and just useful information as possible, which really bleeds into that MTTR Jonesy was talking about earlier as well. Hey, so, Jason, Jason, before you move on, since we've got a dashboard that's got all sorts of metrics on it, let, can you take a moment and just sort of show everyone where the metrics library is? What the, the the metrics viewer is oh yeah absolutely so if we were to go into let's say we edit one of these right so now i'm looking at the request count that tile i just clicked on it um i did not clone this one as my own so i can't play with it i can't like break somebody else's dashboard right now but to your point this is where we could potentially add more metrics we could add filters here um this is part of my custom chart so you can see if i hit this drop down now i can see I have limited options here because this is a dashboard that's publicly available to everybody in our demo. So to keep me from messing around with it, I can't actually add anything to it right now, but you could change things like the rate at which you're aggregating this information. You could add probably hundreds of different metrics here if you wanted. And then ultimately the way that would really look is if we were in the data explorer, this is where you could start running some of these metrics. So to Jones's point earlier, we're actually trying to preload this with a bunch of templates now just to make it easier to kind of wrap your head around how you could potentially leverage the data explorer and the different options you have for the tiles to actually display this data visually so if we were to look for example like largest kubernetes workloads automatically going to build in the code level view but if i go to the build oh, whoops sorry we'll keep it that way and then if i run this query it's going to build out potentially this tile. If I wanted to pin this to a dashboard, here's that option we were talking about earlier. And then there's a lot of other more advanced options within here as well. Like you could play with things like threshold. So let's say, for example, I had a threshold where if this number went over a certain limit, I would want this to turn red or yellow or green. You can play with these numbers here. Um, you can change obviously the color palette that you're using on this dashboard. And you can even change the way which you're actually displaying the data. So we picked one of those templates that was a list. Um, you could change that depending on the actual data set. Not every one of these will apply, but if I were to pick something like pie chart, for example, it's going to change it up for me. And now we're looking at the same data, but a pie chart. And you could pin any of these to your dashboard. 
add more context, add more metrics if you like. Uh, it's pretty flexible. And, and Jason, if you go into the left nav right underneath the data explorer, isn't that the, yeah, that's that's the metrics explorer now or the metrics library. And, and this, you can see here, all the metrics that are available to this instance. Like in this case, there's over 2,500 different metrics that this instance of Dynatrace is currently tracking. Yeah, so these, these would all be available in either your Data Explorer view or to Jonesy's point, if you come to this page, uh, this is actually a pretty slick option here now is you can create a chart directly off of any of the metrics that you find in the Metrics Explorer there as well. Very cool. Thanks, Jason. But back back to you, bud. I was I was just I was thinking that you know since we were talking about visualization, it'd be a good idea so that everyone knows where they can you know get these metrics from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just in the spirit of new things in Dynatrace, this is a fairly new feature. So any users tuning in today that are currently using Dynatrace, definitely encourage you to check this out. Um, there, there's actually a number of new options in here now, but this is probably one of the more relevant ones when it comes to dashboarding. So yeah, we're, we've talked a lot about dashboarding right now. I've kind of mentioned a little bit that uh, obviously Dynatrace, we're trying to give you that more contextually complete end-to-end um, -end picture of how and why everything fits together, how potentially impacting each other. Um, when you do deploy Dynatrace, if we were to take a step back from the dashboard and move into just like, how does the AI actually perceive this? What does this really look like kind of under the hood? This is the Smartscape topology. So this it's a topological map of how everything fits together in Dynatrace as far as the AI is concerned. So what you're seeing here is a dependency map at our service level. So you can see there's a bunch of options here. Like we have our application layer, processes, hosts, data centers. Um, looking at the services, there's, there's quite a lot. There's 525. You'll notice some of these are gray. Some of them are blacked out. So anything that you see kind of blacked out with a dotted line, that means that it's not actually monitored by Dynatrace, but we have something that is making, we have a monitored entity or in this case service that is making calls out to these, uh, these unmonitored entities. So Dynatrace is still gonna make you aware that those things exist. This becomes really, really useful, especially for new deployments when potentially you're not entirely sure like what actually is in your environment um like is is your architecture graph actually up to date maybe it's been a while since it was updated uh, maybe you have thousands of entities that you're looking to monitor you're not entirely sure how they all fit together dynatrace will map this out for you and uh it gives you that n plus one visibility into anything that potentially you didn't know or like weren't aware could have or should have been in scope for the deployment itself and like here's a really good example right here if we were to zoom in on this guy, this is a monitored entity and it's making calls out to a number of unmonitored services here. So it's gonna pick all this up for you automatically. This is one of the very first things that happens in Dynatrace when you do a deployment. And if we were to just kind of peel the onion back a second, instead of just looking at your services, cause I know that spider web view can be kind of overwhelming. If we were to look instead at just a single data center, right? This is giving you more of a zoomed in view. So instead of just looking at everything at large, now I'm looking at everything that lives in this AWS availability zone. So we're looking at our US East 1B. You can see that's down here. In this environment, we have two Windows boxes. We have a couple Linux boxes. We have some, like, uh, some cloud infrastructure, like our classic load balancers, relational databases. And then we can see how everything fits in going up the chain, right? So if we were to look at this Linux box, it's gonna highlight a number of Tomcat processes here. This Tom, These Tomcat processes are supporting a number of services, which ultimately feed all the way up to our apps. So you can see we have a mobile app, we have five different flavors of the web app here. If you click on any one of these, it'll shorten the list for you. It'll show you exactly what that chain of dependencies looks like. So this is really handy like I said, especially during your initial deployment, because it helps you really actually understand or visualize how everything fits together. There's more advanced use cases where this becomes extremely useful, uh, especially if you're something like a ServiceNow consumer, you can integrate directly with the CMDB and it can consume this information. So if there's anybody out there tuning in that is familiar with ServiceNow CMDB, super useful, but also kind of a headache to set up. 
um, we have integration options with that where you can leverage the Smartscape in real time. So that's to say anything that gets added to Dynatrace at any point in time, any new connections that are made, is going to automatically push that into your CMDB if that is an integration, an integration you're using. Um, but this is like a really zoomed out view, right? This is like, okay, I can just see how things fit together, but I really want to know what does the overall performance of these things look like. Um, so if we were to, again, just kind of zoom into one of these, I queued up some of these initially just to kind of give everybody an idea of what this looks like under the hood. So if we were to look at this point, a host, right? So the very bottom of that layer, this is an individual host. So you're going to get things like infrastructure metrics, things that you would probably expect if you are responsible for this hardware running your environment. You're going to get things like your CPU, your memory, your disk, your NIC. You can zoom in to any one of these options, right? We could see all the contributing network interfaces. We could see all the, see all the consuming processes and what those connections look like. You can also analyze all your process connections. This is a pretty handy one, especially if you're part of the infrastructure or network team. You can see we're going to show you a dependency map similar to the Smartscape, but now we're looking more through the lens of your processes and what those connections look like. And as you can see, they can get pretty complex here. So, you know, it's it, Jason, while you're you're on that view, um, I, it, it's so interesting. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to date myself here, but I've been around the industry for coming up on 25, 30 years or something like that. And, you know, back in the day, um, everyone thought of the network as really, um, you know, a, a physical function feature asset that an organization had. And the way that you monitored the network was you used probes and taps. So you basically, you, 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 you know, span your traffic into a device and uh, you use that device to start sniffing packets and analyzing things. But the problem is, is that the clouds really changed that model. I can't span my traffic in the cloud into a device like I used to be able to do. Um, so, so the network is no longer this physical thing. It's very much a logical thing. And one of the things that I like about this, uh, process map that Dynatrace generates is that it is doing a little bit of that classic packet level introspection. Like the agent has a piece of it, which does some PCAP. Uh, PCAP being a term that we use to describe packet capture. And that allows us to understand what process is talking to what other process. And so this becomes, you know, uh, it, it, it's like a hidden feature inside of Dynatrace. Like, honestly, not a lot of people know about it. That's why I love the fact that, Jason, that you took the time to actually show people this. Uh, it's such a useful thing because you could have, you know, a configuration issue that's very specific that could be causing you know two processes that should be talking to each other to not be talking to each other, or a whole bunch of retransmissions sh uh, showing up, or a bunch of uh, you know, uh, you know mess, uh, connection timeouts happening. So this is I I'm really glad that you showed this, Jason. Yeah, I mean the virtualized network. Again, that that is something that's becoming more and more important. Like, like Jones is saying right now, that that's absolutely true, and it's something you get out of the box with Dynatrace. Having said that, um, like Jonesy is not that dated because a lot of real infrastructure, like physical infrastructure, still exists. I, I imagine a lot of people tuning in today. That's absolutely part of your concern if you're part of the infrastructure team. Um, and, and, and we absolutely do support that. So we have a lot of cool options there in the form of our extensions, things like our SNMP monitoring, where we can pull the uh, the metrics, the like the device level metrics, um, the connection level metrics for all of those like classic, um, just your classic network gear. We can pull that all into Dynatrace. It all goes into the same funnel with the Davis AI. Like if it is problematic, let's say a whole bunch of your network devices or your switches start going down, they start failing. They have like actual hardware problems and it's causing a negative impact, let's say on these hosts, on these processes or on the services or the apps, it's going to roll that into your problem cards as well. So just, just do want to make that clear. We absolutely do support still like classic network as well. So, so since, since we're on the topic, Jason, and you're on this screen, go ahead and why not click on the contributing network interfaces down there? 
because this is the perfect example of you know um, here here are the Knicks that you know uh, are assigned now whether or not that's a physical Nick like an actual network card uh, or if it's uh, a virtual Nick like uh, a VPN connection as an example you know we're gonna pull out the traffic and understand hey you know are we seeing a disparity between traffic coming across one Nick compared to another? Um, is my virtual Nick performing in the same way that my physical Nick is? So this is, and, and by Nick, I'm using this as acronym is a, uh, you know, a common one in the industry is essentially, you know, this is your network interface. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to get really into the nuts and bolts of it, just, just one, one last piece to add here is you could potentially put one of these one agents on your physical laptop it's not one of the more popular use cases right now it is starting to get traction with some of our bigger users um and just internally this is kind of jogged my memory jonesy mentioning the vpn we installed them here on the canada team i think last year because we were all having problems with our vpn and you it absolutely shows up in this view right here so let's pretend for a sec this host was actually my laptop and i went to my consuming processes I would be able to see that VPN process in here and we could dig into it and see potentially, does it have a high retransmission rate? Is the traffic lower than expected? Is the connectivity spotty? It's all going to show up in there as well. Um, but yeah, having said that, obviously you can see all the processes running on the box. We're going to give you all those metrics. You can hop into like the connectivity, your memory, your traffic view, the IO, the retransmission rate for any one of these. And just to keep in mind, we're at the host level right now, right? So this is probably like the lowest level you can go unless we go and actually take a look at like a Kubernetes cluster or one of your cloud providers or like a vCenter farm somewhere. But the next logical step to move here would be like, let's move up to one of the processes that sit on this box. So if we were to do that, here is one of the processes sitting on that box. I can see it right here, right? Here it is. Um, this one is actually containerized. You can see it's part of my EKS host group. It's part of my prod namespace up here. Anything in square brackets, we're automatically going to be hoovering up from those integrations. So that's to say those integrations we're talking about that sit under the host, things like your Kubernetes cluster, things like um, your Azure subscriptions, your AWS availability zones. We are going to be able to leverage a lot of the work you've probably already put in there, creating all those tagging rules. We can just pull them right into Dynatrace. And instead of having to recreate the wheel when you start onboarding these things, we're going to pull a lot of it, start leveraging it immediately, and it's going to show up in things like your management zones, your alerting profiles. It's going to show up on the individual entities themselves. Like here, I can see my Kubernetes namespace. It's part of the prod one. So this becomes really, really handy, especially if you already have a mature deployment that exists on any of those platforms. Um, having said that, though, I mean, we're looking at process level metrics, right? So now we don't see anything necessarily related to the physical box. I can't see my disk. I can't see my NIC. I can't see any of that. But now I'm looking at things like the CPU that this process is consuming. I can see like my go routines, my, sorry, my go routines. I can see my suspension time. I can see my memory. I can see the dependencies to any other processes up or downstream. Um, and I get visibility into my vulnerabilities. So this was something I actually kind of skipped over in the host level view. Uh, that is absolutely something that we do at Dynatrace right now, we're able to see any potential AppSec vulnerabilities you have at runtime. So that's to say when you're actually running these out in the wild, or especially maybe in the staging, when you're trying to push these things through your release pipeline, Dynatrace is absolutely like a very popular tool with a lot of our users right now, especially in the release pipeline and staging, um, where you can start flagging these new releases for potential performance issues. That's been like the classic use case, but now a lot of our users are using it for vulnerability detection as well. Um, this one does not happen to have any right now, so that's good. I don't have any problems, that's also good, but I can see things like my availability, my events feed. Uh, this, these views are gonna be available for pretty much every level in Dynatrace. These become really handy in that, I like to refer to the events feed as kind of like a built-in automated change management tool. Um, Change management has come a long way since at least I've been in the industry, but ultimately a lot of it is still just, you have to hope that somebody actually like signed off on commits or actually like maybe there's well, a physical notebook that you're signing. Some of it can get kind of weird. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it, it's great that you mentioned this, Jason, because, you know, 
in a perfect world, you know, everyone's making changes in their run books, right? And they're updating their changes in their run books. And that, that's what happens in a perfect world. But we don't live in a perfect world, unfortunately. And what happens is human beings are prone to skip things, miss things, you know, forget things. And so what's great about this is that if there is a problem, if there is an issue that Dynatrace detects down at the entity level, we can go in and actually see, was there an event? Did somebody miss that, hey, a WAR file got updated and next thing you know, my application blew up. Um, you know, somebody may have just, you know, missed that and not write the, uh, you know, changes in their, in their run books. And next thing you know, uh, there's a problem and everyone's trying to scramble to figure out where the problem is. And and Dynatrace does a really good job of capturing, you know, those, you know, configuration events that that can, you know, potentially lead to problems. Yeah. And timestamps on everything. So, you know, exactly when it happened. Um, and we have an example queued up for you just a couple minutes from now. But you can even see potentially who pushed these things, too. Um, but, yeah, I mean just heading in that direction, right? We're looking at, we looked at hosts, we looked at processes. Um, now the next thing we'd probably want to look at is the actual services running on these processes, right? So I can see there's two services running on this one, my front end and my server front end. Um, so if we were to hop into one, now I can see like, here's that process we were on running on that host. So you can still see that whole, uh, that whole chain of where everything fits in. But now we're looking this is where I'm going to be a little biased. I would say at some of like the more interesting stuff um, in that this is where you're actually starting to look at your web services and you're starting to see what's happening at the transaction layer, potentially how are actual users being impacted um, on different actions within your applications, right? So now I'm looking at my front end service. This one's pretty important. You can see it has a lot of dependencies downstream. It's talking to 10 other services here whole bunch of different technologies. I have one other service, my front end reverse proxy making calls to this one. Um, no database calls, but if those were here, you'd see all those queries as well. And you can see things instead of like infrastructure metrics, now we're showing you things like your response time, your failure rate, your CPU, your throughput. You can view all the actual API endpoints being hit by any of these web services. Uh, you get your resource requests, just like the high level. What does that look like? You can see all these other options here for understanding dependencies, right? So things like view related logs or view web requests, view the backtrace. Um, these are all extremely useful, especially when it comes to actually trying to figure out what's happening potentially on real life problems. Um, just as an example, this thing is probably like criminally underappreciated by a lot of our users right now. It's the view backtrace. Right. This is where it's just going to show you where are all of the transactions going through the service coming from? Where do they originate from? This becomes super useful, especially for, again, new deployments when you're not entirely sure how everything fits together. And when I say that, I mean, it's going to point out things where you have calls potentially from unmonitored devices that potentially are failing. In this case, nothing is. So that's nice. But let's say all of these unknown ones were failing or let's say all of a sudden at some point during the day your database just started getting hammered and you took a look at the um you took a look at the backtrace and you saw oh okay there's like a hundred thousand requests that came through in the last 10 seconds from some unknown page it's going to pick that up it's going to flag it it's probably going to show up in a problem card but we're going to visualize it for you here as well and then you can just really quickly dial in on like where and how all of these requests are hitting your service. Um, but yeah, we, again, we could dig into a lot of this probably for hours and hours and uh, we have a lot more I want to cover today. So just taking a look at everything else that you're getting here at this view, you can see things like your hotspots, your problem feed, the hotspots is pretty important because we're just going to show you like the really low hanging fruit, the, like the top performance, um, things that are impacting just overall performance on your services here. So right now I can see I have a high failure rate, 16%. This is important to note because if this climbs over time, it might trigger a problem card. Um, now, if it, keeps prob uh, if it keeps increasing over time, that problem card will get updated. Um, the reason I'm saying this is important is because a lot of, or the way alerting is handled for a lot of our newer users 
is you would set something like a static threshold. And oftentimes that static threshold is quite high. So I've seen things like don't alert me until I'm at 20 or 30% failure rate or my response time is 20 seconds. And I mean, those are legitimate thresholds. Um, if you're like, yeah, when it gets to 20%, it's broken. But realistically, you want to be aware of that before it's broken, right? That, that's that's one of the main things we're trying to address here in Dynatrace. We're trying to make you aware of these issues before they take down the whole environment or before everything just gets bricked and your users are just getting served 500s on your front end. We'll let you know as soon as things start trending poorly. We'll let you know if they get worse. But ideally, we want to start sounding fire alarms for you more proactively instead of having you react to, oh, OK, everything is down. Let's look into it. We're going to let you know before that happens. Hey, Jason, we've got a question from Buck. <laughs> and and Buck asked a couple of questions around uh, showing the top query and the most amount of CPU and memory. <laughs> can, can you just hop into the database? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so as far as Dynatrace is concerned, the view we're looking at right now, this is at like the same layer as those web services. So you're getting a lot, like the layout looks pretty similar, but it has more of a, a database theme to it. So now I can see there's three other services calling the database. I can see it's sitting on my Azure SQL server here. Here's your throughput. Here's your database availability. Again, you get those current hotspots. So um, to that question of like, can I see potentially really expensive or terrible queries? The answer is absolutely yes. So we could view all the statements if you want, like you can see your SQL transactions, your modifications, your queries, procedures. We could view that backtrace view. Uh, we could view any traces related to these individual requests, or we could hop right into hotspots, right? So here is an example right here. And Again, similar to that service view, you get a lot of the same options. Like you can analyze failure rate, analyze uh, your response time. You can view distributed traces, view the backtrace. You get the actual query itself. So like, here's my total time. Here's my response time. And then here's like the slowest 10%. And then you get a lot of options on how you want to potentially slice and dice that as well. So you could view the outliers. Um, let's say this is only affecting like a small subset of users. It would show up here for you. If it was failing, you could view those failures as well or any exceptions. And then if you want to, you could also hop into the individual traces. So these are individual instances of users doing something, um, initiating that service, uh, that transaction through whichever service process this and made this query. So if I were to hop in to this trace, for example, I can then see that it is part of this transaction. Pretty long one with a lot of DB queries, actually. So if I scroll to the top, this was somebody on our front end that was trying to find journeys, right? So it was all kicked off by this service here. You can see like it's our Azure journey service. The request was find locations and it kicked off all these subsequent calls. So you're going to get your individual timing breakdown. If there were any bottlenecks here, let's say at the method level, we'd be able to zoom into those hotspots for you. Um, you get a breakdown for your threads. This one's kind of basic in that there's only the one. Um, you get your code level view. So this is an actual just call tree for all the methods associated with each one of these service requests. So find locations, made all of these calls. Uh, and you can see here are the two like, uh, the two synchronous calls to journey service check destination there it is and i can see the sql commit there it is and then eventually it called find journeys at the bottom right so find journeys made another call to journey service made another call to find journeys and made a whole bunch of subsequent sql queries so if we hop into these here is that you know what this one's kind of a boring one let's pick a more exciting query for you here you go so Find journeys here, made a couple of SQL queries. Here's a select statement. Here's the executions, the number of returned, uh, like rows returned. You can see your individual timings again. And um, we don't really have 
I don't think a ton of problems running in here right now. But let's just say we did have a really big, like, slow response time um, on SQL. Or let's just say you had a crazy huge query with, like, a thousand unions or joins in it. And all of a sudden, you get hit with a spike in traffic and everything just starts slowing down. We would be able to point that out and it would show up in a problem card for you. You could zoom into it down to this level if you wanted um, through the actual trace view. Or you could go back to the actual database itself, right? So if we hop back to one of these database services, it would show up here in one of your hotspots as well. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks for walking through the uh, the database question there, Jason. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, you know what? On the topic of traces, just to show you guys something really cool for a second here. So we're gonna we're gonna skip along to problem cards and front ends in just a moment. Uh, but just to give you an idea of something else, uh, this is fairly new in Dynatrace. Um, with the advent of Grail, um, it's only going to become like more useful. Is um, If I were to look at, let's say, a trace. So we know Cart Checkout has a problem, right? So we clicked on this earlier. And I want to click on one of the ones that failed here so I can see this red bar. If we go into one of these traces, so this is going to be similar to the one we just looked at in a database, but it's running on that uh, front end service we were looking at earlier. So I picked this one specifically because I know that it is linked to one of our front end apps. And I also know that it has some of our new logging features turned on. So again, you're going to get a lot of the same information here. So your topology information, this one's actually linked up to a front end application. So I can even see that this was triggered by somebody clicking on cart checkout. I can see where the application is. Um, I get all my timings. I get my code level view. But now we've started turning this on, I believe, for some of these services here. Perfect. We are also going to be able to give you like your logs, but through the context of traces. So traditionally, a lot of our users use Dynatrace for one side of things. Like typically, you would use it to look up your front end user sessions. You'd be like, yep, that's a problem. Somebody called in. I found their session. I looked up what they did. OK, I saw failures. And now I got to go query this and just double check it in my log analytics tool. So we have updated our log analytics tremendously. Um, obviously, definitely, if you can, tune in to that Ask Me Anything for Grail because there's going to be a lot more information there. But this is something that's live in the product right now, today, where we can now just take those logs generated by each one of these services for each unique transaction, and we can associate them with these traces. So if I were to hit the details here, here is the log message itself. Here's all the context, right? Where did this thing come from? So in this case, it's from my EKS cluster. You get a whole lot of information like the pod, the group, the namespace. Um, it's all going to be here. You get your attributes information. So a whole lot of other window dressing from the Dynatrace side of things. And then at the top here is where it gets kind of a little bit more interesting. I could view the user session that actually triggered this. I could view the code that actually generated this message in the code level tab. So if I click on this one, uh, oh, you know what? I think this one is one of our synchronous ones. So it is probably hidden right now. But it would have shown you the method. And then you can also go back to the classic log viewer. So this probably looks familiar to anybody that's used any logging analytics tool really we've, we've tried to make it as user friendly as possible so it should be pretty familiar to anybody actually using it but now i'm looking at any of the logs generated by this individual trace so you can see it got filtered here at the top because we injected this unique trace id to it we associated everything together and again you can click into these you get all the same information we could hop back to the trace or like i said we can link this back to an individual user to an individual action on that user session on your front end. So we've kind of gone around investigating this in a backwards way a little bit. Typically, you'd be looking at it from here and you'd drill down into your trace, into your logs. But just to show you how those connections are being made and, again, how we're trying to map out these dependencies for you because, like, nothing really lives on an island in your environment. Ultimately, like, your front end lives on your back end. So they're going to always be just dependent on each other. We're trying to map out these things for you. 
So now we're looking at an actual real user. This is a real person. I can see that they were connecting from Japan. Here's their ISP. Here's the OS they were running. I can see that they ran into an actual error and they had a frustrating experience on our hipster shop application. And I can see the frustrating experience came from this action that we were looking at the logs from because it took six and a half seconds. And then from here, you could drill into the waterfall view. We'll show you the individual timings for all the assets that were associated with this action. And here is the one we were looking at that used up all the time, right? 6.28 seconds spent on this document request to checkout. And that was the trace that we were looking at earlier. So if we click in this, it's just going to take us right back to this point. So, J so Jason, just to summer, you know, really quickly summarize this. It's just incredible that you're able to go from here's a user doing something in their browser, and I can trace that transaction back to the tiers that were responsible for responding to that request, and on top of that. I'm able to actually now drill down into the logs that were generated off that specific user's action. That's just super cool. Like I, I, I honestly can't think that there's much in the industry right now that allows someone to do this in such a unique end-to-end -end fashion. Everyone talks about end-to-end, -end, but this is showing it in a way that uh, I, I've, I certainly haven't seen elsewhere in the industry. Uh, we've got like about 10 minutes left. Where, where else did you want to go, Jason? So the next place I wanted to go is we've looked at pretty much everything, right? And I've been hammering home the idea of like how things depend on each other. So I wanted to walk everybody through a problem card here. And... Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's anything else that anybody wanted to talk about, absolutely. We could we could switch gears here, talk about something else. If there's any other questions in the chat, be happy to take those on. Um, but just I wanted to give everybody an idea of like ultimately what does this all mean in the in the grand scheme of Dynatrace, right? So it's like it's nice to know all of these things that I've shown you today. It's it's extremely useful. Um, realistically, when you're using Dynatrace 90% of the time, you're probably gonna spend most of your time either looking at a dashboard or waiting for alerts to come through. So this is an example of what one of those alerts would look like. I mentioned this at the start, but these are generated dynamically, right? So everything I've shown you today, one thing I didn't mention is the AI is baseline in the performance of everything. So that is one of the reasons it's mapping out those dependencies. It's mapping, it's not only is it just telling you what all these connections look like, it is baseline in the performance of every single metric that we are monitoring. So your response time, your throughput, your retransmission rate, literally everything is being baselined by the Davis AI in the background and it's being moved over time. So you're always gonna have the most up-to-date um, performance thresholds for literally everything you're monitoring with Dynatrace instead of actually just setting static ones, setting it, forgetting about it. And it's just been sitting at like a static threshold for years and years. Nobody's really sure why or how you came up with that number. We take all the guesswork out here. Davis AI does it for you. And one of the benefits of doing that is it's gonna generate these problem cards for you automatically now. And I mean, this one I picked as an example because it touches a little bit of everything. So right away, I can see that this is a problem affecting my front end, I have a whole bunch of application problems. I can see that infrastructure is a part of this, services is a part of this, and it's impacting two of my front end apps. So, I mean, if this happened out in the wild and you were not running Dynatrace, this might be 13 different alerts to maybe 13 different teams. Um, if you manage to kind of just gather everybody in one room or a Zoom call, probably everybody just blames infrastructure and then you reconvene an hour or two later after you restart the app we're trying to be a little bit more proactive here and we're trying to just remove the need to potentially call all those people into one room uh, and then we're trying to just give you useful valuable information on how or why things went sideways so we're going to give you a breakdown of what all of those impacts looked like in context so at the front end we'll, we'll give you the business impact analysis so i know like 932 users were impacted on a bunch of different flavors of the application, like my easy travel, my angular version, our weather easy travel, our mobile app. We'll give you a breakdown of which actions the users are actually being impacted on. 
you could hop into those impacted users directly from this page. We'll do the same thing for the underlying services. That's to say all the entry points will tell you how, like what is the actual rate of impact on this, right? And we'll show you exactly which of those API endpoints within your web services are being impacted. If we were to click into these services through this problem card, we'll even show you how far outside of baseline you are. Um, we'll tell you just right on this page, actually, how far outside of baseline you are for your front end users. I can see I'm like 242% slower and that this is a global problem. It's impacting all browsers, all geolocations, all OSs. And then to give you a little bit even more context, we're running synthetics in this environment. So that's also something available in Dynatrace. We have like 120 plus synthetic nodes. Uh, just publicly available all around the globe. You can see this one's running from Dublin in, Mumbai, in Mumbai. These are being impacted right now on a synthetic script we're running against this same application that, oh, sorry, that is being impacted and is currently impacting real users. So we're just kind of confirming that, yeah, you know what, this is a problem. Not only are real users being impacted, so are our synthetics. We'll give you a visual resolution path so just kind of talking about the whole war room scenario, I like to refer to this as more of like that whiteboard you typically see there. This is a whiteboard without the guesswork and it's interactive. So if I hit this play button, it'll show you how the problem evolved over time. And I mean, if I skip ahead to the peak here, I have 49 ongoing events, 13 different components. They're all highlighted in red here. You can see exactly what those components are in this dropdown and you could jump into any one of them from this page. If you were responsible for, let's say, check destination or that synthetic monitor or some of the infrastructure running this, you'd be able to hop in and see exactly how you were impacted at this exact moment in time. And then the most important piece of it all, right? The actual root cause. So this is where we're trying to cut down on that MTTR that Jonesy was talking about earlier. Right away, I can tell you, check destination. This service is the root cause of this whole problem. In fact, I can see that somebody pushed a deployment and it was a bad deployment. And here's that integration with ServiceNow we were talking about. Somebody pushed it, it was bad. We automatically flagged it, pushed this alert to ServiceNow. ServiceNow said, yep, that was a bad release. And it kicked off a remediation job, which automatically rolled us back to a previous release. So ultimately this problem was only open for 26 minutes, solved itself. Um, but even if you didn't have auto remediation enabled, you'd still get everything on this page, just minus this remediation piece. And then I mentioned earlier, you can even see potentially who's pushing these releases. In this case, here's the owner, Chuck Ryan. He pushed this release. So you would probably give this person this card. And then from here, they could analyze, okay, clearly that was a bad release. It's one thing to tell somebody that's a bad release, please go fix it. Um, it's another thing entirely to tell somebody, hey, that's a bad release why don't we take a look at the method hotspots because we can see it was a response time thing and you know what it looks like it's actually this location parser calculate section index method it's contributing 98.5 percent of the response time to this problem i mean you've probably saved this person potentially hours of work um, i'm like three clicks away from the problem card and now i'm looking at the classes that make up the method you could download those code snippets from here drop them in a compiler and at that point, you should be able to figure out what was wrong with the release. So the reason I wanted to end off with the problem card here, uh, I know we only got two minutes left, is that this is ultimately what we're trying to deliver with Dynatrace, right? We're trying to take all of like these various streams and just feed them into like more of a river in the form of these problem cards. We're trying to give you the most context we can. Um, and, we're trying to give you more valuable insight in these problem cards. We're trying to eliminate things like um, mean time to investigation. Uh, we're trying to reduce your mean time to resolution. We're trying to just eliminate the whole concept of war rooms. And we're trying to make you more proactive in the way that you're actually trying to tackle just performance and overall visibility of your environment. Jason, just, you know, thank you so much. That was a great job and a great demonstration. I always love having you on uh, because you have a unique way of uh, demonstrating Dynatrace and, you know, going from that sort of bottom up uh, point of view. 
So, folks, uh, listen, this is it. This is uh, our getting to know Dynatrace session. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, another session coming up in a couple of weeks. Next week, I'll call out again that we have a specific Ask Me Anything session related to our Grail technology. So please feel free to join us for that. And uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Again, Jason, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great demonstration. Really appreciated it. Uh, <laughs> try that again really appreciate uh re appreciated that uh demonstration there jason and and with that we'll we'll call it that's uh this week's session of getting to know dynatrace and and folks as always feel free to give dynatrace a try uh just go to dynatrace.com slash free trial and uh you can try out everything that jason showed you today and so we'll see you next time on getting to know dynatrace